I think we are live, right? Okay, I think we can start. I can see already a good number of participants. Um, and we are live also uh, on the IFMSA Facebook page. So uh, everyone is able to be uh, joining us. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in this world. Um, IFMSA or the International Federation of Medical Students Associations is very happy and delighted to be hosting this webinar. Um, we uh, wanted you to join us for a conversation about medical students in the times of uh, COVID-19. Um, it's, um, the title was very well chosen because we wanted to simulate a little bit um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the novel of Gabriel Marquez so we can highlight a different story uh, from a, a different pandemic at a different time. Um, as any uh, human being on this planet, we are living in a very particular situation in our current time. And um, as this generation um, is um, very particularly well connected worldwide, we wanted to make sure that everyone is aware, everyone is um, participating and everyone is um, maybe um, thinking globally and acting locally as we always do in IFMSA. So as uh, may, if many of you do not know uh, or are not very much familiar with IFMSA, uh, it's the International Federation of Medical Students Associations and um, it's a network, a global network that connects uh, 1.3 medical students worldwide currently um, in uh, 140 countries worldwide. Um, and so far, um, we are in the current situation, on the current uh, pandemic, a global conversation has arisen about um, how has medical students uh, been affected by uh, this current pandemic and um, what is medical education looking like so far uh, in the times of uh, whether you are in quarantine or not and uh, how medical students are participating in the fight against the global pandemic. So um, if we can go to the next slide, please. No, the one beforehand, thank you. Um, so yes, so what we are going to discuss currently is um, what is the status of medical education worldwide uh, during the current pandemic? Um, is medical education still uh, ongoing? Are medical schools opening the, their, do their doors to medical students or not? Are they continuing their education? If yes, and how? And we're going to see um, more particularly the role of medical students to the current pandemic, not only theoretically, but also through concrete examples. Um, and we're going to discuss medical uh, schools um, and how they are not only um, 
adapting to the current situation, but also what uh, what can we foresee from medical schools um, after the pandemic and after uh, the current situation is resolved. And also it, it can be a floor for reflections, questions and answers. So every participant in, uh, in our webinar can share with us also their uh, reflections, their stories, and even ask us some questions and we hopefully can find some answers together. Um, today with me, um, I am not alone. Um, uh, my name is Marwan and I'm the current uh, director of the Standing Committee of Medical Education. But I also have with me uh, Anna from Sudan. Uh, she's the Asian officer for, student, uh, for medical education issues. Um, and we have with us um, uh, Professor Trevor Gibbs, uh, who is um, uh, the AME president. Uh, it's the Association of Medical Education in Europe. Um, as well as we have uh, medical, uh, we have medical, different medical students from different countries. We have Abdullah Akhabaji from uh, and F. Walsh from the SCOMI international team. Uh, we have also uh, Gemma from the UK. We have um, Salma from Morocco, Aditya from India, Pedro from Colombia, and um, Alma from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, all these people are going to sh be sharing with us their views and their um, and their opinions, but also their experiences uh, when it comes to uh, their living in the current pandemic. Um, so let's go to the first question, which is, what is the current situation of medical education worldwide regarding the current pandemic? And can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. Um, so currently, as we have said earlier, um, IFMSA is a global network for medical students worldwide uh, that connects more than uh, 1 million medical students. And as we work with directly with uh, national representatives, uh, especially for medical education uh, globally, we have a close network and a close space where they get to communicate with each other. and. Um, the current situation has uh, ignited a conversation between these national representatives uh, in order to exchange their situations and to make sure that they um, to make sure that um, they also um, share their situation and uh, exchange good practices between uh, they are living uh, as medical students and medical schools uh, and also see uh, how their medical schools are being adaptive um, to um, restoring and continuing education uh, in the current situation. Um, so this way we as a federation we have uh, been able to collect a uh, uh, and centralize all of these information in a way that we can track uh, how medical education um, uh, is being uh, is going on currently. So if it, so, we can see if it is suspended or not, and uh, we can see uh, what are the alternative measures that are being taken in a way uh, to uh, make sure that the medical education is being continued. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So, so far we have been able to track 100 uh, countries um, and, uh, and uh, we're able to track like 2,729 medical schools from uh, 100 countries worldwide from the different regions. And um, so far we have been able to see and notice that uh, 93 uh, out of 100 medical schools are suspending their, their, um, their education for over uh, 2,584 uh, 2, medical schools are suspending their education uh, when it comes to uh, the physical education and their physical presence of medical students uh, in their um, facilities. Um, and this way we are uh, being able to see that all this great number of medical schools that are uh, switching to a different platform and switching to 
um, switch into a different alternative way uh, to make sure that medical um, education is being continued and uh, is being always accessible to their medical students. Um, can we go to the next slide? But so far, most of these medical schools uh, have been able to uh, continue their medical education via the online platform. And uh, as we can see here, um, more than 60% of medical schools uh, are offering uh, an online education platform in a way that uh, the lectures and uh, the courses are being always delivered uh, continuously in, uh, to medical schools uh, while they are home. Um, so medical students currently are being, uh, are living a, an alternative approach to education, which is the online or uh, education or e-learning. And we can see uh, uh, later on what are the different methodologies that are used as well as uh, what are the pros and cons of these um, platforms? And uh, we can uh, deeply dive on what do we think as medical students of these platforms. And maybe here I would like to have um, Abdullah so he can maybe give us more insight on um, about e-learning and medical education. Thank you very much, Marwan. Uh, again, my name is Abdullah. I am the SCOMA General Assistant of IFMSA. And now I'm going to present to you some very interesting data that we have been collecting. So uh, among the range of activities that uh, IFMSA in general and SCOMI in specific have been conducting uh, towards the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have conducted a survey regarding the effect on, and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on medical education. So uh, the survey is still going on and we're still getting responses. So I'll be presenting to you some quick analysis of their, their answers that we have uh, received so far. And um, start with the teaching methodologies, the alternative teaching methodologies that have been followed in some countries as Marwan previously mentioned. So uh, we ask our participants uh, worldwide the question of if do you have an alternative approach or teaching methodology within your medical education, your medical school, uh, which uh, specific teaching methodologies have been used? And uh, a percentage of 77% of the respondents have declared that they have been provided with online lectures. Another percentage of 31% mentioned that they are taking clinical case discussions online and 27% also mentioned that they are taking online tutorials and also 26% uh, have been having small group discuss uh, discussions and small group teaching also online. The platforms that have been used to uh, deliver those methodologies uh, have been uh, majorly divided into two big groups. The first one is the publicly available platforms, including YouTube and Zoom and such kind of, uh, let's say, social media platforms and available and accessible platforms online. Uh, while the majority, 64% uh, of the platforms that have been used to deliver those methodologies have been uh, private platforms, including uh, and such uh, platforms. The feedback towards those uh, have been quite variant. 8% uh, of uh, the medical students mentioned that they have been taking online simulations and the online simulations that have been receiving uh, in different medical schools got the best uh, the best rating from uh, medical students in regards of quality, followed by small group teaching and online tutorials. All right, now, of the pandemic 
And uh, unfortunately, the major percentage of 55% of the respondents uh, mentioned that there were no plans developed for the exams. Uh, so uh, they are taking online lectures, they are taking uh, alternative methodologies, but still there are no exams planned. Uh, because in 26% of uh, the responses that we received, there are alternative online exams, but that could not be the case or could not be applicable for uh, all the medical schools worldwide, and it depends on preparedness of the medical school itself. Uh, otherwise, uh, the exams uh, have been postponed to be physically held after the pandemic is over in uh, around 70% of the response that we got through our survey. And in some cases, uh, the exams that are not uh, necessarily of uh, high priority have been canceled uh, or also postponed to a later uh, date. So uh, I would like to mention here that the data that we have been collecting are still preliminary and we are collecting more responses. The deadline is still not off. The survey has been distributed to our national member organizations uh, to be filled by our uh, members in medical education to have a clear insight on the impact of uh, the pandemic on medical education worldwide. And hereby, I would like to pass the mic to my colleague of uh, this common area for Europe to continue with the pros and cons of uh, e-learning methodologies. Thank you, Abdullah. So, uh, like Abdullah said, there are many um, methods of e-learning and we're going to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of them. Now, what I would like from all our participants and viewers is to give me their thoughts on what they think are the pros and cons. So, you can um, post them in the conversation on the right of your screen and just let us know what you think are the good sides or the not so good sides of e-learning. And afterwards, we'll also hear what our uh, speakers have to say. Now, let's see, don't be shy. In the uh, coming minutes, yeah, it's uncomfortable to study online. Okay, why, why would you say it's uncomfortable? You can stay at home, you don't have to travel. Staying at home is a big favorite. The schedule is flexible, very nice. Okay, less interactive. Nice, we have lots of inputs. So it can be less interactive. It's, it might be more difficult to focus. No human interaction. You can study at your own rate, okay. No contact with patients, all right. Lectures being recorded, mm -hmm. Okay, I see physical examination again, true. No direct questions to the teachers. <laughs> if the lecture inter isn't interesting, I can mute and study on my own. That's another option. Okay, many regions don't have facilities to access e-learning. All right. So, lots of you have mostly covered many of the aspects that I will tell you about. So, you can just keep writing so people have your input too, but I will just Keep on, you can go to the next slide, Abdullah. Thank you. So there are several areas in which we could discuss the pros and cons. So when I started making my slides, I started having a table with on one side the pros and on the other the cons. And then I realized that I was just going to put all of these areas in both pros and cons. So just like our nice mayor from the night maybe for Christmas, they are very interchangeable. So let's start with the flexibility. Like you said, on one, on one side, you can just study whenever you want. If you want to go sleep, you can go sleep, pick it up later. 
Um, flexibility also means flexibility in when you study, but how much you study. So if you are not so motivated, if you're prone to procrastination, maybe you'll have less support in doing your work. Um, there are lots of distractions at home. Uh, you can, I mean, I have a cat, so I know what that's like. Uh, flexibility also means that it can be more student-centered. If you need more time on one topic, just take your time because you don't uh, need to catch up with the teacher who keeps speaking, right? Then there's the flexibility of the teacher, um, meaning that some are more comfortable than others with online teaching. I mean, if you started teaching medicine uh, 40 years ago, then maybe you never learned how to use online platforms, you're not used to it, you're not comfortable. So that will also uh, make a difference. Then we have uh, an aspect of resources. Online courses can give you so many possible resources. You can uh, have a webinar where the professor just speaks and you listen. You can have smaller online meetings where everyone interacts. You can have simulation, quizzes, serious gaming, lots and lots of possibilities. And um, so this actually gives you many more options than just a class in amphitheater. On the other hand, less interaction, like you said, you can't really work together. Um, and the resources bring us to the costs. On one hand, um, e-learning can reduce costs because the university doesn't have to pay for the rooms, for the insurance of students coming into their facilities. Students don't have to pay for the travel. I mean, I'm sure you all noticed that since the confinement, no one buys fuel anymore. Uh, on the other hand, not all students have a computer or have internet. Um, sometimes we don't realize that because maybe some of us are in a more comfortable situation but not everyone has these uh, resources that university provides them otherwise. And this brings us to equity. E-learning can increase equity because you have less costs of housing and travel. You can take your own time to study. You can access way more resources. But on the other hand, and that is maybe something that impacts us during this situation here with the coronavirus, those students who don't have a computer because they usually use the university resources can't learn now. And for the two, three coming months, they won't have access to their resources. So that's actually a big issue. We have to make the difference between e-learning in a, in a comfortable state where you decided, where the university decided to do e-learning as an educational choice versus e-learning because we're not allowed to use the university facilities, right? And because we're not allowed to meet. So e-learning also allows us to have a broader target audience, right? Because you don't need to limit yourself to just your university. You can have students from all over the world if you want, if you have a topic that can interest more people. Then on the interaction level, uh, many, many people mentioned interaction. It's true. With online courses, if it's just a webinar, well, the teacher speaks and you listen or you don't listen. And first of all, the teacher won't really know. He doesn't have any direct feedback from the students. I mean, right now, maybe you're sleeping in front of the computer or maybe you're listening to me. I can't know, right? Except for your comments, of course. Uh, then questions from students. Um, if you don't have the professor in front of you, it's not as easy to ask a question and interrupt them, right? Uh, so that's during the classes. Although if you have online meetings and smaller groups, you can still interact very well with the professor. Then the communication with the medical school, if you're not on site, if you don't go to the facilities, it's easier to miss an email or forget to send one. So that's also an, an aspect that we should take into account. Then there's the interaction between learners. Um, you need to meet people to feel good, to have a good mental health, right? You need to see your friends, to see other people, your co-workers. So that's a big aspect that you lose with online working because meeting someone on the internet is never quite the same as seeing them in person. Um, and also, you can have teamwork. You can have online team, um, smaller groups, but it's more difficult to 
draw on the same picture, have a, um, a mental map together. It's, it's not quite the same. So these are some of the cons, but you can have many, many solutions to that. Then this leads us to assessment. We talked about this. What are the solutions of most universities for assessment right now? Uh, make them, have them later, have them online. So what does online assessment mean? Some universities consider uh, just having the written exam and filming the students to make sure they don't cheat. But I'm sure we can all find ways to cheat if we want to have our course in front of us while passing the exam. So that's not gonna work they could think of other things, right? Uh, a way to assess us would be to have an open book exam with maybe limited time. So you see there are many, many opportunities with online assessment too. We just need to think about it. You can test students' reasoning. Uh, we have lots of uh, applications. I'm thinking about in CMU, AMBOSS, any patient simulation applications that can test your clinical reasoning. Clinical reasoning leads us to clinical skills. How are you gonna le learn your clinical skills online? Uh, that can see, be seen as a big con, right? Well, two aspects again. Uh, how are you gonna learn how to hear a heart murmur? Well, hopefully someday you have a patient who has one, or you can have them record it and listen to them on an online course. So that's a good aspect of it, that you don't actually depend on having the patient who has the right disease. Uh, it gives you uh, many more um, examples. On the other hand, there are some gestures and technical acts that you can't learn online, so it's not sufficient. Now, I talked about gestures and the patient. You can learn lots of things online, but communicating with the patient, knowing how they feel, that's not really something that can be simulated or Maybe it can, maybe you won't agree with me, right? On the other hand, the advantage if you do simulation is that you increase patient safety because it's a big concern that um, people, that students see their first patient and maybe they'll do their first blood something on them. And okay, do you tell the patient that it was your first one? How are you gonna, how are you gonna handle this? It's not easy for the patient either. So there are some possibilities there. So here you go. I talked a bit about lots of um, the pros and cons of medical education. Now I'd like to hear about you. You can put them in the comments on the site and maybe some of my co-speakers would like to say something. We have students as well as a professor, so that's nice. Hi, it's Trevor here. I, I've got a few things to ask you, but maybe they also overlap with what I would say later on. So perhaps we can come back to that later, if you don't mind, from my perspective. Absolutely. Uh, now, how about my fellow students who would like to talk? Do you have any ideas on that? What do you think, for example, about um, clinical skills? Do you think online teaching is a good way to learn clinical skills or not? No, it's not a good way. Okay, why not? All right, we need to feel the patient, true. Exactly, so that's a very good point. We can learn the skills, the basics of them, but we need to practice them in a real surrounding. But here's an idea, yeah, online for rare disease. How about learning online how to hear the right heart sounds, how to reason, and then test it on the Because personally, my university is four and a half years of theory, theory and then you just hop into this patient's room and you start uh, working with them. Okay, apps are maybe not ideal. So uh, yeah, maybe the online resources can be improved. Okay, thank you. I think we have lots of uh, good comments there. Don't hesitate to keep commenting and maybe I can 
leave the floor. Add something else. Yes. Can you hear me well? Good. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think one of the main cons for e-learning is that, I wouldn't say it's a con, but it's uh, a challenge for e-learning, which is the lack of resources that uh, you have mentioned earlier. And I just would like to emphasize it because um, uh, not in all countries and not in all regions that medical students or even medical schools have the resources to implement e-learning. Um, some medical students that uh, I know, uh, even in my country, do not have a laptop or um, usually access to internet. Um, so that is one of the big challenges that is facing uh, medical students worldwide and uh, e-learning in general. So uh, that's one of the additions that I wanted to highlight as well. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings us back to equity, right? Indeed, yes. Um, thank you, Ab, so much. Um, I, uh, it's a very interesting to, to hear that what medical students think about um, e-learning and their education in the current uh, pandemic and to see uh, what are the pros and cons and uh, how they reflect on their current education. Um, but medical students are not only subject to educational programs, but they are also uh, joining uh, their efforts with the, with the health workforce, whatever they are, uh, so they can uh, join their efforts in fighting against the, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, since we know there is a big shortage in uh, health workers worldwide, and uh, this uh, pandemic has proven that uh, has proven that that uh, the need of uh, more doctors and more um, health workers in general to be involved and thus lays the role of medical students. Uh, so let's hear maybe uh, uh, some stories about uh, meaningful students' involvement in the fight against the pandemic. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes. So we have here some uh, guest students that are uh, actively involved in the current pandemic uh, and uh, supporting whether health services or raising awareness, etc. Uh, and uh, can we go to the next slide? So we have here an example from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Alba will be talking uh, to us about her experience as a medical student. Okay, I hope that everyone can hear me. Uh, it's Alma from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I am the National Officer for Medical Education here in Bosnia. Uh, currently, I am living in Sarajevo in the capital and I am a fourth year medical student. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to the webinar and for giving us the opportunity to present uh, everything that we have done during the pandemic so far. Uh, our work was based on two main projects, which are the Bohemsa COVID-19 online campaign and peer-to-peer -peer online, which is basically a tutoring program. I will tell you a bit more uh, later on. So the first project I will talk about is about a uh, informational campaign about coronavirus, mainly consisting out of evidence-based medicine. The main goal at the start of the project was to spread awareness via social media, but as the project went on, providing a reliable source of information became our primary goal and also, of course, responsibility. Uh, our main source of information is uh, the WHO, whose official statistics, facts, and guidelines we uh, were being translated to our language, as you can see in the slide, and presented to our social media followers. Uh, besides that, students contacted some of the leading medical experts in our country to answer some of the most frequently asked questions about the virus and distinguish myths from facts. Uh, we think that it is very important to provide a source of uh, easily accessible and visually stimulating information for a broader audience. And that's mostly why we started this project. Uh, a few posters and examples are here in the slide, but if you want to see more, uh, you can visit us on our Facebook or Instagram page. Um, the links uh, cannot, seem be, cannot be seen here because they kind of got away, but you just uh, type in Bohemsa and it will show. Okay, uh, the second project is Peer-to-Peer, uh, -peer, uh, which is a online, tu uh, online tutoring program in which we created uh, online study groups for preclinical students. 
uh, in every group, we have a tutor who is like a, a fellow student with really good grades from certain subjects, uh, whose role is to help the students prepare for upcoming, upcoming exams and also to help them understand the studied content. Uh, this contributes to medical education by maintaining the quality of knowledge uh, as much as possible during difficult times when quality medical education is as hard to achieve as ever. Uh, and uh, this pl the platform that we use for this project is Zoom, is Zoom so uh, it's the same one that we are on right now. Um, both of those projects are self-initiated and carried out by Bohemsa members, and I really want to take the opportunity to thank them for their contribution because I know that many of them are listening to us right now. Uh, we really feel like the implementation of activities like this uh, help the students to keep a sense of purpose in these very difficult times and uh, also to help them grow as future healthcare professionals. Uh, I also personally think that our projects are a great example for how you can be safe and stay at home for your own sake and also for the sake of public health and yet still play a really important role and contribute to the fight against the current pandemic. So uh, maybe I was a bit fast, but I was told that I have a, a time limit. So if you have any questions about our uh, project, uh, you can ask us in the comment section and I will try to answer it. Or if not, we can switch to the next. Thank you, Alma. Maybe we can have the questions at the end of uh, the webinar. So if anyone would like to ask anything about any part, uh, we can... Uh, have them uh, by the end. And we can move to the next uh, uh, next uh, example. Okay, there you can see our Facebook and Instagram. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Pedro Benavides and the National Officer of Medical Education of Colombia. Um, as in call are following in the time, the steps and the decisions made by the doctors, the role that we have assumed are um, one um, donation campaign for affected families that, for example, need food, and two, national strategy to educate the people, such as provide information about prevention myths, why you stay at home, information about pregnancy, um, about sexual relations, inquiries and discrimination and like xenophobia, um, also relate to medical stuff, um, information on database, community support lines for family violence, um, adapt all this information to people with disabilities. In our network, Networks and we are sharing talks, webinars, not only about COVID, but also about different topics, tra trying to improve the knowledge of some of the students um, about the topic that they are resigned during the online classes. We also uh, start projects with other associations of medical students, um, of residents and doctors too, and such as project of complaint about a lack of biosecurity equipment. Um, we um, also considered to create a group of medical staff volunteers, which uh, should have previously trained with the virtual courses offered by the WHO. All of that, um, a forum of COVID cases that we create on Twitter was the training we've had about the pandemic. Actually, um, we uh, feel protected uh, because all medical students have suspended their um, face-to-face -face classes, so they have managed to fulfill their quarantine. However, um, and for internship uh, students, it's not the same. This week, uh, the government broke the agreements established with the medical education uh, associations about graduating early internship students and um, give to everyone jobs. Yesterday, the health minister said that they don't have job for everyone. Um, students don't know what to do. Also, it's a uh, and they are the only one who will still continue attending their 
their classes where they face a risky scenario without all the perfection. So that's all, thanks. Thank you very much, Pedro. Again, if you have any questions to address to Pedro or any of us, you can leave them and we will answer them later on at the end. We can go ahead, Nitya. Hello everyone. I am Aditya Mohanty, an intern at LTMMC Mumbai. I am the local officer for medical education. In India, we have shut down all medical schools since the 22nd of March as part of a massive nationwide lockdown. Medical students from the years one to four have been provided study aids for home learning, including live or pre-recorded online lectures, PPTs, tests, and other resources by many universities. On the other hand, classroom lectures, practical lab sessions, clinical rotations, and hospital-based learning all have been temporarily suspended. Year four medical students and interns were given a COVID-19 training course covering the basics of the disease as well as the role they would play in combating this pandemic at a local level. Interns were given the following duties. Triage them, uh, screen all passengers at major airports and triage them to home quarantine or facility-based quarantine, as well as document their demographic details for telephonic follow-up. Periodically reevaluate and triage patients who develop symptoms in quarantine facilities and transfer them to a COVID-19 isolation ward. Interns monitor patients and update their clinical record in COVID-19 isolation wards in public as well as private hospitals, thoroughly counsel and then discharge the patients who have recovered. Interns in emergency rooms triage patients from the community with symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 and refer them for swab collection and further testing. At COVID-19 dedicated emergency helpline call centers, interns answer questions from the general public about COVID-19 and the exact procedure to be followed for testing or hospital admission, as well as follow up with the home quarantine patients. We also continue to work in other departments of the hospital, like outpatient departments and the wards, which has a high risk of potential contact with undiagnosed or asymptomatic COVID-19 patients. A few points of concern that we have noticed are a constant lack or shortage of PPE as well as N95 masks for all healthcare workers. And we are also worried about infecting our colleagues at the hospital or our families at home after doing a shift of COVID-19 duty. Thank you very much for listening. We will win this war against COVID-19 only if all of us stay safe, take care of ourselves and all healthcare workers on the front lines. Thank you again. Thank you, Aditya. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Salma Soussi. I'm a final year medical student from the Faculty of Medicine of Marrakesh, Morocco. I'm also an ex-medical education officer and currently working on CBME implementation in undergraduate curriculum. Uh, I'll start my presentation with a short story. So my thesis defense, that's my graduation, was due Thursday, March 19. But thanks to the COVID pandemic, I received an email two days before saying that courses and thesis were suspended. And that's why I'm a doctor yet. So yeah. that did prevent me or many of my colleagues in the same situation to get involved in the crisis management. And today, I summarize our student engagement in Marrakesh into two volunteering projects. The first one is the SAMU 141, or the COVID-19 Emergency Call Service. So our volunteers went through a rigorous selection process uh, because we didn't want uh, to take a risk of contaminating the center. So everyone who worked in hot departments, which were COVID-positive departments, were not included in the volunteering. Uh, finally, we had 70 volunteers divided into 10 supervisors who were generally senior medical students and freshly graduated doctors and 60 regulators, generally fifth, sixth year medical students. Each supervisor had in his under his responsibility six regulators and the regulators did a quick history 
taken through phone calls, then transferred suspect cases to their supervisor, who then filtered the case and sent and had an ambulance sent to their homes so they can be tested. Uh, the, the call center had uh, individual boxes for each volunteer that were separated by walls and glass. They also had uh, disinfection products and hydroalcoholic gels, so protection was not really one of our concerns. But the challenge we faced was uh, the constant evolution of the definition in suspect cases in COVID that actually depended on the epidemiologic phase that our country was facing. So each phase one, phase two, phase three. So uh, we had our supervisors elaborating uh, volunteer uh, guides regularly. So they had to do that almost every week. So we overcame the challenge. Uh, the second project was the triage team, and these guys are real uh, heroes. They were frontline in the emergency department. Uh, we had 30 volunteers that were senior medical students and new doctors, and their task was to orientate patients coming to emergency department into COVID and non-COVID uh, channels through uh, history taking and uh, and that, and we got a positive feedback from the ER doctors that this um, initiative alleviated the charge of work they, they had uh, days before. So these volunteers received training by the ER head of department and uh, they had uh, personal protective equipment as shown in the picture. Uh, so that was not a concern as well as far as, I'm, as I know. So um, that's it for the student engagement in pandemic crisis in Marrakesh, Morocco. And I think uh, similar projects are being done throughout other cities. Um, that's it. So thank you and uh, be safe, everyone. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. I'd be happy to help. Um, Can we go to the next slide, please, uh, Bella? Okay, so hi there, my name's Gemma and I'm from the UK. Um, I'll mostly be talking from a personal rather than an NMO perspective because um, I'm also uh, one of the fast-tracked final year students, meaning I became a doctor last week instead of in June as expected. Um, just to be clear, I am still waiting for instructions about when I will start working, so I thought I'd just explain a little bit about how I came to be in this position and then touch on some of the other roles students are playing and a bit about protection from infection. So although the timing and logistics of fast track graduation vary between our UK medical schools, almost all of them are doing this in some way. And this decision was taken in order to allow us to support the workforce better in a formal capacity where we have more impact such as prescribing, which would not be possible had our graduation instead been delayed. While we do have a national prescribing exam, which took place in February, the structure and timing of final clinical exams varies considerably by each medical school. Therefore, some students had already taken part to all of their exams and simply the graduation date was brought forward. For one of my friends at a different medical school, her practical exams were brought forward by one week. However, her final exam was cancelled at 10 p.m. the night before. In my case, my final exams were meant to take place the first week of May. Initially, these were going to be replaced with an online exam we could take from home. 
However, after our government announced that 5,500 final year medical students would be moving to the front line by next week in a surprise press conference, the decision changed. Medical schools would now do what's called a programmatic review, meaning those who met certain criteria, such as scoring well in coursework, previous exams and professional reports would not have to do the online exam and could start work before then. Students who did not meet all the criteria would still have to do the exam. About 70% of my year met the criteria and were graduated after a board meeting. So we're all currently applying for provisional registration and expect to start work within the next two weeks. We can either work near our medical school or where we're due to start our jobs in August. For me, I'll work near my medical school in Leeds because my next job is in London and I don't have a place to live there yet and I'm already familiar with the hospitals in Leeds. So for these new jobs that will take place between now and August, they're called interim foundation posts or FIY1 posts. And the guidance of what they'll look like is as follows on the, on the left hand side of your screens. So they'll be paid at the same rate as an FY1 doctor. So that's your first year after graduating. They'll have indemnity cover, protective hours, and they'll be voluntary. So you're not obliged to take one up. And if you do, you can quit with 48 hours notice if you're finding it difficult. The tasks we've been assured will involve things like note taking, ordering investigations, and things like cannulation and supervised prescribing and completion of discharge documentation. We've been told we're not going to be asked to work in the makeshift hospitals, for example, those in, being made in business centres, and that our hours should be between seven o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock in the evening. And in a recent preparation webinar, most people volunteering for these types of jobs gave their preparedness as around five out of 10. However, we've been assured that we'll receive an induction, training and supervision. It will be challenging, but I am hearing from doctor colleagues that this is the most supported that they have felt in their roles. Traditional medical hierarchy has disappeared with consultants helping out with jobs such as emptying out bins and the camaraderie is really heartwarming. I am anxious about starting work early, but also believe that it's the right thing to do in my situation and that the experience will make me a better doctor. So for medical students not in final year, many are volunteering in different ways, but I wanted to just highlight two. Local helping hands groups have formed a national health supporters network, connecting healthcare staff and students to assist with childcare, shopping and non other non clinical tasks. And another option popular with students is to work as healthcare assistants or nursing auxiliaries. Many students, including myself, already worked in this job through ma throughout medical school on weekends and holidays. However, due to the pandemic, hospitals are not providing normal training for people new to the role and are assuming students will be able to cope with doubt with the training due to clinical experience. Therefore, we are running online student-led peer education and support groups to aid the transition into this role, as it is actually quite different from the duties of a medical student. Finally, one of the questions I was asked for this webinar was, are medical students protected against risk of infection? Like in many places, we are experiencing shortages and confusions over guidance. As students, we are told that we are entitled to PPE, that's personal protective equipment, including masks, but in practice, this could be difficult when even existing staff are struggling with it. There are even reports of staff improvising with bin liners and facing disciplinary action if they raise concerns. I'm worried that students especially may not have the confidence to insist on appropriate PPE. The UK is predicted to have more overall deaths from COVID-19 than the rest of Europe put together, so I can only see the situation getting worse and we need to find sustainable solutions. So until now, my role has been more in a research capacity, specifically on the roles of medical students worldwide in the current and past pandemics. And it's with trepidation, excitement and solidarity that I will make the early transition to a full-time member of the medical workforce in my country in the coming weeks. Um, feel free to ask me any questions about this as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Jima. I think your experience that you just shared with us would be very relevant um, as I speak on the next segment, which is about challenges that medical education is facing because of COVID-19. Um, reflecting on everything that you guys said so far, um, and more in like a summary point of view, I think that COVID-19 will make us question the resilience of medical education systems. 
suddenly medical education systems are facing an immense uh, load and uh, different circumstances. And it seems so that not all the systems are able to keep up in the required way. There is also an amplified inequity, whilst there are some countries with systems that were able to resort to online learning because they had the adequate infrastructure and resources, other countries are in a complete shutdown because they do not have the adequate infrastructure. And to me, honestly, it feels as though um, e-learning was presumed to be a luxury in medical education until COVID-19 happened. And now people responsible for medical education systems should be rethinking the role of e-learning more in depth when it comes to medical education. Uh, a lot of what Ev said and the chat that we had um, with our participants, you pointed out the pros and cons of e-learning. And I just wanted to add something from my perspective, and that is the importance of collaborative practice in patient safety. We're seeing so far that um, whilst e-learning can supplement a lot of the theoretical learning, it, it does compromise team-based learning. And that raises the question of how can we reinforce collaborative learning, collaborative practice, and ensure that patient safety is not compromised if medical education systems need to resort to e-learning in such situations and pandemics. It's not the world's first time to face a pandemic, but it appears to me that it's as though medical education systems are having a shock phase where they, we are failing to react. And this will let us think more about how we should um, have enough literature and enough research to support how medical education should be reforming in the face of pandemics such as COVID-19. Now, I really want to thank Jima to, um, because she shared with us her experience with fast-tracking final year medical students. And as we read a lot of these articles, um, Personally, I also heard of the US and in our country, they tried to do that, but they failed miserably. Um, a key question comes to my mind and it's a key challenge as well. Is fast tracking of final year medical students considered to be a breach to health workforce regulation? Because ideally health workforce regulation passes through a certain sequence before a doctor is deemed competent to practice on patients and does fast tracking jeopardize those um, systems that are put in place. The last thing that I feel is a challenge when it comes to medical education and COVID-19 is mental health. And whilst we all know that mental health of healthcare professionals has been downplayed in the past, uh, I think COVID-19 pandemic has really put on the spotlight the problems that healthcare professionals face when it comes to mental health. And it should be a question of how medical education can make sure that healthcare professionals are not only better prepared to address pandemic situation, but are also able to um, recognize the importance of mental health and supplement that. Now, these are just overall broad points that I liked to just put out there and help stimulate thoughts. But I think uh, Professor Trevor would have much more to say and definitely reflect on everything that we have said so far. Trevor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let, just let me introduce myself because some of you may not know me. My name is Trevor, Trevor Gibbs. I'm the president of the Association for Medical Education in Europe, which although it has Europe in its name, is actually a global association. Uh, it's actually, there's my little photograph in the corner so you can see what I look like. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating listening to everybody this afternoon and Thank you, Allah, for, for, for inviting me to contribute. It's, um, it's always good to hear uh, what the students think and what the students say and what the think students would like to do. Sadly, we don't always recognise that, but hopefully with Amy, we, we do. Um, and I've been fascinated by some of the, the activities and, and perhaps we can cover that a little bit later on. If you show my first slide, please. What I want to do is not so much look at, um, oh, there you go. Not so much look at uh, what's happening now, but also a little bit crystal, um, crystal ball gaze and look towards the future. We know that the world as we know it will never be the same post COVID. Uh, and that's the only, only positive thing that's probably gonna come out of COVID. Uh, we're never going to be the same. Next slide, please. Uh, 
keep going. Thank you. Why? Because I suppose we've seen so much different things happening. We've got incredible social disruption. Um, the social disruption has brought out the positive things and the negative things in people. It's brought out the best in people, it's brought out the worst in people. The best in people has been the fantastic collaboration, fantastic work, the fantastic getting together that's happened um, as a result of COVID. And that's really, really marked within my organization, which is the NHS from the UK. Uh, but I think it's probably demonstrated in all the presentations that we've seen um, this afternoon. Um, I, my background is as an oncologist and general practitioner in the UK, uh, but I left that over 15 years ago now to concentrate on uh, medical education around the world. But over this last two weeks, I've actually been um, back on the front line. I've been working in uh, part time in a in a hospice for for terminal care patients and manning one 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 telephone lines here for people who need to ask questions. Been absolutely fantastic, and I'm not the only one who's done that. There's thousands and thousands of people have done that. So it's brought out very important parts of um, society. It's also sadly, and I'm sure Gemma will understand this, it's brought out the negative side of society as well. I've seen incredible amounts of selfish behaviour and I've particularly put on the, on the toilet roll on the right hand side of my screen, not because I want to show photographs of toilet rolls really, but the very fact that we, we quickly ran out of toilet rolls almost on the first day that COVID was announced, which showed the selfishness of, of our population. Of course, as we're talking about today, it's all the educational change that's been disrupted and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit when I talk about uh, some different aspects. I think what we've seen as well is a changing healthcare of the patient and, 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 uh, and safety of the patient. Um, with working in the, with, the, in the, with the terminally ill patients, with cancer patients over these last couple of weeks, it's been quite sad to, feel, to hear from them that they felt socially and clinically isolated. Everything seems to have been taken over by the COVID N. And, and there's a lot of cancer patients that are not getting the right treatment or not getting the same treatment or getting the appropriate treatment that they needed. I think we also have seen a big um, problem with faculty safety, particularly in the, in the UK where the uh, PPE uh, is not being available as so it should do and that um, actually if you go back a little bit to the previous slide thank you not this one yet so we've, we've seen the, the we've seen the problems of, of um, safety of people it's nice to hear the students previously talking about the psychological well-being um, We've never really concentrated on this very much in terms of faculty, your teachers and of the students. Um, but I, again, I'll talk about that um, later. But I think one of the big things that is caused a big challenge is the uncertainty. There is so much uncertainty around what we're doing at the moment. We don't really understand COVID. We don't know it's public health properly yet. We don't know about its transmission. We don't know why some countries are faring worse than others. There's a lot of work there. So that, so that uncertainty is, is, a, is a tremendous element within all of our lives today. Next slide, please. But one of the things that's going to happen as you know, the world is, is never going to be the same post COVID, nor will be the world of healthcare education. And I want to probably concentrate a little bit on a couple of aspects of that, if the next slide can go up, to say, well, as a result of COVID-19, what do you think we will see um, in, in terms of changes? What will change over these next, let's say, 10 years even, or even less, five years? The next slide, please. I want to couch it under these, these um, 
five, well, there's four on this screen, but next screen, another one, these, these subheadings. Let's have a look at the teaching and learning. And, and again, I've recognized what people are talking about. We've got technology enhanced learning, tell, and we've got simulation. We're now seeing the positive side of that. And I would see the positive side being at least people are starting to wake up towards the benefits of um, simulation, e-learning, technology enhanced learning, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to call it. And the positive side of that is because it's emerging into the real world of education now, we can start doing some research on it. Because I think your chat room conversations have demonstrated that we're not that confident that it's given us what we think it's going to give us. I, as somebody who has been graduating, um, graduated now for 50 years, my goodness, he's graduated for 50 years, um, I, I had no technology to, um, training at all. Uh, but I'm fascinated with technology. But that fascination is not good enough. We have to show that, in fact, it's actually effective and it's producing fit for purpose, fit for practice practitioners that we need. The negative effects is the similar because we're not quite sure how we do it. We're not sure which is the best way. We've been trying to collect thing, uh, um, various resources in Amy at the moment, and the number of resources that we're, we're collecting is incredible. Everybody's saying this is a new, modern, innovative way of learning, but it's, nothing's been proven. So I, I think we have to be very careful that we don't put all our eggs in the e-learning basket, if that's what, you, what, what we can call it. We have to think about it. The positive things, at least we will start thinking about it and we'll start researching it. Assessment is interesting. We, if I travel around the world, there are a credible number of medical school schools who still leave assessment till that last final hurdle. And as Gemma explained as well in the UK, this has really caught us out because we need those medical students, we need those good medical students to actually take over early, the FIY1, very difficult to actually say that Gemma, FIY1 um, students now to be competent, to be confident, to be able to do those things. And if we leave everything to assessment right to the very end, then we can't do that. So I think what we will see now is a much more change into what's called programmatic assessment. Assessment as you go along, right from year one, right to year five, six, or whatever number of years you have. So I think we'll see that developing a lot more now so that we're confident that as you progress, you're progressing and on along the right track rather than wait till the very end and then say, nope, sorry, you're not good enough. I think we'll see the emergence of a lot more formative assessment where you're giving very effective feedback onto how you're progressing. This will raise the confidence and the motivation of the students. I think we'll get rid of that final year hurdle and we'll create an apprenticeship model where we transfer that last year into almost what Gemma's going to be doing now, the FIY1 year, where you have much more responsibility. Selection is going to be interesting because I think we've seen it this year in the UK, there are no um, A levels or S levels that we can count on to select students for, for medical students, uh, medical school. What do we do? Well, we're really going to have to rely on other tests that assess how, how good that student is, how apt they are, how ready they are to become a medical student. So we'll see the development of much more MMIs, multiple mini interviews, and what's called situational judgment test to test the, the reasoning skills. I'm not saying the clinical reasoning skills, the reasoning skills of the potential medical students. I think we see also the emergence of a lot more personality profiles. What have you been doing whilst you're at school? What are you like as a person? Are you really that right person 
that should be doing medicine. You shouldn't be the one whose father and mother pushes you that way because they want you to do it and then fail at the end of third year or something like that. We want those people who are going to succeed and that I think comes from the development of personality profiles prior to medical school. And of course, we've got this graduation and progression. When should you be graduating? When should you be saying, well, you're almost there to be a, a new doctor? When should we start now progressing people up the ladder? Um, it's very difficult at the moment in the UK where FY1 doctors don't know how they're going to progress into FY2 if all of their assessment modalities have been changed. Um, so I think as a result of this, we will see a lot more competency models coming in. What is a competent doctor? What is a competent surgeon? What is a competent physician? What is a competent pediatrician? Competency models and the bringing in of what's called EPAs, Entrustable Professional Activities, that I'm sure some of you have heard about, they will start creeping in, not just in, in the postgraduate work, into undergraduate stages as well. So by the time you are in your fifth year or sixth year, your final year, and you are doing the apprenticeship model, we will be assessing people, looking at people, looking at students saying, oh yeah, you're nearly there. I can trust you to do this. I'll give you a big tick on that competency. And it's a collection of those competencies that will drive students forward. Can I have the next slide, please? I think one of the things that really is pleasing me at the moment is that we're going to start looking at the psychological well-being of our students, as well as our faculty, of course. Too many students struggle, not because of their academic status, because of, but for many other reasons. And hopefully, we'll now start looking at the struggling students and seeing how we can help them rather than only recognising them for their skills at doing exams. I was pretty useless at medical school. Uh, I didn't like exams. I did a lot of practical work and I got on very well. Um, and I struggled simply because I didn't like the exams and I couldn't do the exams. Nobody was there to help me. People need that help. Student needs that help. We should be looking more at the resilience now and the wellness of our students. Many schools are introducing these programs into their curricula. And I think really the bottom line is we should be monitoring the students much more carefully and very early intervention plus remediation will change the student from probably failing to definitely being a doctor. Next slide, please. So just to finish off, and I, it has been a, a bit of a whirlwind trip, but I hope you, you probably picked some of the things up that I wanted you to pick up. This world, is, as we know it, will never be the same post-COVID. But as many of you have said, but with careful thought, it can be a better world. We can change this world. We can change this world of healthcare education as a result of this. Always with these pandemics, it's what we learn from them that matters, what we learn from SARS, what we learn from MERS, what we learn from Ebola, what we learn from Zika virus. Everything is a learning situation. I hope we are learning from these. Uh, very happy to answer questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Trevor. I think you did indeed share a lot of valuable um, insights on how medical education would be adapting post-COVID. Um, now looking at the Q&A section, um, please post your questions if you have any. We also have a lot of questions from Facebook um, because we are airing live on Facebook. And one of the questions that we have is how medical students can play a stronger role in addressing the COVID pandemic. And of course, these questions are open to all panelists. 
uh, feel free to answer if you have um, relevance to this question. Perhaps if I could start then, um, I'll, uh, if you don't, sorry, is that okay? Yes, of course, of course. Sorry, I thought somebody else was coming in. I think it, it's just a really important question and we've seen this afternoon how uh, people have been getting involved, um, the Bosnia-Herzegovina um, students getting involved, the Colombia, the Mumbai, the Moroccan students, the UK students, that is great. It's fantastic, but it's got to be a balanced thing. We just can't throw our students into, into the, let's call it the bull ring and expect them to walk out again. And we have to think of their safety. We have to think of um, insurance issues. We have to think of patient safety as a result of that. Uh, um, so it's a, it's a very fine balance. In a, in a big emergency, of course, we all step up to the plate. We all want to work. We all want to contribute. But we do have a casualties as a result of that. Sadly, in this, this COVID-19, some of those casualties have actually been um, mortalities as well. And I don't want to see that. So yes, let's let, as a general, general feeling, let's step up to the plate and help. But let's be careful as well. Don't let's just jump, jump into the fire. I agree very much with that. It's become a, a very large concern how medical students and healthcare professionals can make sure that their health comes first, whilst as well helping patients. Um, questions? If we can also, and if I, you allow me to jump in, um, we can also address the question to our participants here and to everyone um, here as well from the panelists. <clears throat> Maybe what would be our thoughts of the quality of education after the pandemic? Um, how do we envision us recuperating and um, our medical schools uh, providing the best quality education uh, after the pandemic and after the quarantines? Um, is being lifted. Um, so maybe it can be a moment of reflection for all of us, uh, for even for the participants to join us as well for the reflection. Um, hi. Um, it's Salma here from Morocco. Uh, what I want to share is not a question, but maybe a thought, an idea, a reflection. Um, I think this COVID-19 crisis taught us many things. The first one is the fact that our cri country's crisis management units were not prepared enough to face pandemics this big. And it is maybe time for medical educators, medical education researchers to draw up on the pandemic wisdom. So uh, to, to incorporate um, crisis management modules to the medical curriculum, whether in the form of electives or inter intercalation masters, etc. Et um, and the second idea, which I agree with uh, Professor Trevor, is that um, we face uh, an urgent need to speed up the process of graduation to serve the urgent population uh, needs. And I think part of the answer to that problem lies in the premises held by competency-based medication, and one of its core principles being that's an approach that is less time-based and more competency-based. So we can reduce, I mean, if we uh, succeed in implementing CBME in undergrad curriculum, we can succeed in shortening the length one day of uh, the curriculum that is six years, so seven years, eight years in Morocco, for instance, to uh, to a length that is uh, like less years, and and our focus will be more on um, achieving a set of competencies and validating a set of interestable professional activities uh, by the learner. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's Trevor here, if I may add as well. I think one of the things that I hope it will do is to make people in some of the 
uh, more, um, some of the still developing countries of the world recognize how important education is, how important medical education is, and how important keeping up with the 21st century medical education is. I teach a lot in China, and I know from working in uh, Hubei province in Wuhan that they had predicted that something was going to happen like this, and they had in their curricula disaster medicine. Uh, and I think that's probably why they've done so well in that particular province, and that's why um, now the UK mortality figures are much higher than China. Um, and, and in terms of percentage of people who've got seems have got seems to have got the the virus, um, so I think it, it, I hope it starts to bring out some equity. I think it starts to bring out some equality, and I think I hope it starts to bring out some um, recognition that medical education is really important, and it's not just about reading books. It's actually getting take, taking that theory into practice. I think if we if we do look back at some time, um, we may see that those schools that had a very good simulation, very good clinical exposure, very good clinical practice part of their curricula do fare better than those who have a very theoretical driven knowledge-based, reading the books, going to lectures um, type of curriculum. Um, I might, could I just add as well, um, thank you very much for your answers about this. Um, in my talk, you might have uh, heard me say that I've, we've been doing some research about um, what kind of roles and uh, experiences medical students had had in past pandemics so or does other global health emergencies and one of the outcomes from the literature review is that there were consistently calls for better disaster preparedness and pandemic preparedness um, topics in medical education curriculums um, that in most cases don't seem to have been implemented i'm sure we're all aware that trying to get other kinds of important topics onto medical education curriculums can be difficult at the best of times. Um, but hopefully after the, the shock of this pandemic that we're experiencing currently, the will to change the curriculums and include those sorts of topics and competencies might be increased and will hopefully be better prepared for uh, any inevitable other global health emergencies in future. So I'd, I'd really like to see that happening. And if I may add to that, I think after COVID, if the world survives COVID, um, there is room for more partnerships because the dichotomy between medical education systems and healthcare systems has always been very clear. And um, I think after this pandemic, we should learn that healthcare systems and medical education should be more closely um, affiliated and should partner more. And I think partnerships not only uh, with regards to healthcare systems, but also with initiatives and organizations and enterprises that work on e-learning, uh, but are not necessarily affiliated to universities. So we have a lot of those independent um, enterprises, but we do not have um, direct partnerships with medical education or universities around the world. So maybe it is time to consider more partnerships, more intersector collaboration, because if the world has le learned something, it's that COVID or pandemics in general cannot be um, met single-handedly. Uh, I really agree with everything said so far, um, and I'm trying to read through those questions that I, you, you are asking here in the comments section. Uh, and many of you are searching uh, for a solution uh, for uh, after this pandemic. Uh, I really uh, personally think that due to major differences from country to country, it's almost uh, impossible to create like a, something like a unique model for all universities. Uh, but the thing that we can have in common is the same main goal, which should be maintaining uh, the quality, quality of knowledge. Like since we don't know how long the pandemic is going to last, I think Professor Gitz already addressed that. Um, it's also hard to set a time frame in which we could make up for all lost classes and practice hours. 
but the thing that we can do is establish good communication between students and the universities. Um, we should explore each other's needs and priorities and really talk it out to see what our options are and uh, what is possible and what is not. Um, I'm really mentioning this because I see it as a possible problem in my country and I'm sure that we are not the only one with this concern. Maybe some of the concrete measures I would suggest is uh, maybe organizing as many interactive uh, online classes as possible, which would be like regarding to the let's say lecture part, but for clinical practice, I think that uh, online solutions are not the best options. So. Um, maybe I would suggest extended practice time during summer uh, being a good way to make up for lost clinical hours. Thank you so much. I think one of the interesting questions that we have from our participants in the chat, and I'm going to read it out, um, is now the time to press for the incorporation of crisis standards of care in undergraduate curriculum that includes the protection of medical doctors and how they treat in an all hazards context, as well as how they are protected. Um, so basically, the question is, should we press for a crisis standards of care in curriculum, protecting medical doctors and how they also treat in hazardous context? If anyone would like to answer that. Um. I think if, if you if you'd allow me, I, I think the, the answer to that has got to be a yes, whether it's taken up or not is a diff, it's a different different matter. I think always with curricula, it's um, if you introduce something new, you have to drop something off at the other side, something has to go. Um, and that's only through actually rationalizing your curricula. There was, I think there was a, a question earlier on about whether um, we should have what I, what I would call faculty development programs so that the, the faculty members, the teachers of the future are actually understand medical education and the best way to deliver medical education. And I think if there was more faculty development programs, um, then people would realize that, that Curricula are there to learn from. Um, curricula are there not to be just taught. Um, there's students, as I said, are, are not stupid. They don't come to medical school because they're stupid, they're clever. A lot of what is taught to them, they can just read from the books. A lot of what is learnt, they learn by experience. So I think we do have to rationalise, revolutionise and ev make it through evolution that we change all of our medical curricula to one that's appropriate for the real world, not the one that was a world 50 years ago. I think there's a horrible statistic, uh, and I think it's true in that 50% of what you learned five years ago is either wrong or out of date, which is a bit frightening if you've got a curriculum that's five years long or if you like the Chinese have got a curriculum that's eight years long, um, quite a lot of what you've learned is already out of date. So I think there is a very strong need, and I hope it would come out of this, for faculty development, which then would allow things that are happening now to be in the curricula and not base the curricula on things that happened many, many years ago. Yes, I think I very much agree with that. And um, this also brings us to the concept of having socially accountable medical education, which is basically shaping the education based on um, the current needs of communities. One of the questions that we have in our Q&A section is, what will be the solution to the lack of equity in medical education across the world, especially in this time of the pandemic? Um, now, if I may answer that question, because um, inequity is very much amplified during such times, I think the solution would just be a greater investment in the development of medical education, especially in parts of the world where it is um, falling behind. And the whole um, world will need to consider a general increase in investment and exchange of resources, whether um, technical or even just knowledge sharing when it comes to developing medical education. This is some of the things that I'm excited about because 
I think after COVID passes, um, a lot of people will pay more attention to the importance of medical education, acknowledge the need to invest and um, acknowledge the need to have more knowledge sharing and experience sharing when it comes to development of medical education. Does anyone want to add to that? Uh, if I may add, sorry to I feel as I'm talking too much, is that one of the things that's going to change also is the empowerment of the medical student. I think most importantly is that empowerment because the future of medical education, the future of medicine lies in your hands, doesn't lie now much more in my hands simply because as I get older, uh, then I'd expect people like yourselves to take over. So hopefully, it, the, one good thing that will come out of COVID, I hope, is the empowerment of, of the medical student. Listen to medical students, do to get, in, get the medical students involved with the way that you shape your curriculum. I could not agree more. Definitely more empowerment is something that we're experiencing. And I think this is very encouraging. So thank you so much for saying that, Trevor. And a lot of medical students are watching us right now. And this is the message that we want to send across. We are the future of medical education and the more empowered you are, um, the more change and development can happen to medical education in the future. Now, I'm very much aware that we have a lot of questions, uh, but we're also a bit over time. Marwan? Yes, thank you, Anna. Um, I think I will just um, conclude with one question that I have noticed from, uh, uh, from the questions on our Facebook chat. Uh, which is mainly as um, students' organizations, whether within ISA or any other health organization that would like to uh, increase their involvement in the current pandemic and do not know exactly what to do or what would be their um, contribution. Uh, um, so, I just like to would like also what uh, my friend here from Bosnia has said. Um, there is no perfect model that everyone can follow. Uh, the, everything is circumstantial. Everything is um, related to the current situation or the current resources that your country is having, as well as your uh, system and uh, the manpower that you are having uh, as medical students. Basically, my recommendations on, and our recommendations as well is just to. Uh, first of all, uh, awareness, because it's not only about um, the awareness of the public about the current pandemic and its um, uh, and what it entails, but also uh, the awareness of medical students of the, uh, the impact of the pandemic on the medical education systems, as well as uh, the health system uh, overall, and how much does it impact? Uh, uh, does it impact uh, the resilience of uh, their systems on the on a national level. So, your awareness is very important as a first step in order to make sure that you would know what uh, the next steps will be uh, as an action to take um, as medical students organization. Um, so, I would really like encourage you to uh, maybe conduct local research to see uh, what are the weak points and what are uh, the strength points in your. Um, uh, in your countries in order to make sure that you would identify what are the steps that you would like to follow, whether it is um, communities awareness, whether it is uh, medical students empowerment and um, empowering their education, uh, whether it is uh, resources sharing and fundraising, um, as you have seen the examples of uh, our peers here present with us today. Um, I wish we could have answered um, all of your questions, but um, we are a little bit of all of our time. Um, thank you again, uh, everyone who have attended our webinar. Uh, thank you uh, to the panelists. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Abdullah, Ev, um, Salma, Alma, uh, Aditya, Pedro, and Gemma. Thank you so much for being present. Thank you, everyone for your interactivity and um, for your participation with your questions. We have learned so much from you and I hope that um, this um, 
webinar was as uh, informative as it was for us. Um, and I think with this, we would like to close um, our webinar. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Thank you. It's been really great having you, Trevor, and I hope you had a great time. I did. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.